Excellent. Welcome. So we are working on some new videos for food chemistry class and I certainly wish we were in person and doing a lot more activities together. However, we make the best of the situation and honestly, I've been working on videos through Niagara College for a while in, in some of these themes because it's one of those inclusive teaching mechanisms that by having content online, it supports in-person teaching. Students who perhaps need some language assistance through closed captioning are able to see the content and use online platforms for that. In other cases, people need language support because perhaps English isn't their first language. And so video content is extremely useful, especially for technical fields like chemistry. So. I've got some videos coming down the pipeline uh, for our food chemistry uh, second year course. And today we're going to talk about the function of water in foods. And if you've been following along in this course, we spent the front half of this course on design of experiments. And now we're going to think about macromolecules in food systems and really dig into their structure and function and remind ourselves about some of the analytical methods that you have been introduced to perhaps in another course or introduce some new analytical methods to you. So, function of water in foods. At the end of this video, you will be able to discuss the role of water in foods. Say, hey, surprise! <laughs> You'll describe the molecular structures of water and will differentiate between the types of intermolecular forces, including London dispersion forces, dipoles, hydrogen bonding, and ionic interactions, and it will relate intermolecular forces to typical solutions in food. And last but not least, we will describe the role of water in cellular structure for food texture. We do have a bunch of other videos coming down the pipeline related to colligative properties and formation of solutions and dispersions. So do watch out because there will be more videos in this series related to water and solutions in food. We also have some videos on measuring moisture content, measuring water activity as well. So water, why do I care? Well, it happens to be the most prevalent macro molecule in food products. And honestly, most foods are made up of a large percentage of water. And thinking of biological systems, honestly, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I always think back to the Star Trek line. Biological systems are, in general, large bags of mostly water. And uh, the Star Trek line is actually ugly bags of mostly water. But I, I'm sure you are all beautiful people. You are. I enjoy working with you. And so biological things, that is in general what we are eating. We are eating plants, we are eating animal products, we are eating products that are in their base form, mostly water, most of the time. So just a, a quick reference from our uh, Owen Fenema uh, food chemistry reference. Most food products have water contents that are actually quite high. Now, there are processed products, things like um, pastas and crackers and chips that are very low in water content. Some things like hard candies, coffee, honey, these also have low natural water contents. But for the most part, if it's a fresh fruit, vegetable or protein, it typically is reasonably high in water, uh, in some cases greater than 90% water. And that's quite remarkable because if you're thinking about things um, texturally, we have to think about how is that water interacting? And in the case of so much of this, we have such a robust texture because that water is still retained in cellular structures. And as such, those cellular uh, interactions, how that water is retained within the cell is really important. So. Think about the fact that food is mostly water for the most part, and we need to be thinking deliberately about how that water is interacting to get the effects that we want. So water is a wonderful molecule. Now, this is actually an image of two water molecules, and we've got H2O. So I know many of the students who are taking the course at Niagara College have not taken chemistry since high school, and in some cases haven't taken chemistry in many, many, many years because they've been in the industry for a while and they've come back to school. So I want to take things stepwise. H2O, what on earth do we mean? H is hydrogen. And when we say H2, we mean there's two of them. 
So two hydrogens and an oxygen. Now, why did I put up this image? Well, I wanted to start talking about the fact that water is a really remarkable molecule and it has so many different types of interactions within foods because it can exhibit many of the different types of intramolecular forces. So water has hydrogen and hydrogen is capable of participating in, uh, wait for it, uh, hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonding is the capability of hydrogen to interact because of its specific atomic, uh, its, its positive charge ratio that it has. Water can dissociate into ions. So it can form hydronium ion and hydroxy ion. And as such, it can participate in ionic interactions. Water has a really strong dipole moment. And what I mean, uh, what I mean by a dipole is that it has these partial charges within its structure. And so when you see this delta, that's a delta, that delta negative, the oxygen within water has a net negative charge and the hydrogen of course as you mentioned before has a net positive so as you know positive and negative like to interact and you can see this sort of dipole formation in water and the one force that we often ignore because it's it's such a limited force it actually is really important to think about and that's london dispersion forces this is where you are looking at imposed, I want to say miniature dipoles, to use really, really plain language, just within the, the atomic structure itself, as the um, electrons swirl around on the atom itself, those electrons change in their density and you get these really microscopic, if I can use that term, um, really minute changes in the dipole moment that allow for nonpolar molecules, so molecules that don't have these um, partial charges, to actually interact with each other. It's a, one of the weakest forces, but it's important to note because in some cases we are reliant on London dispersion forces to have what we call miscibility. Let's talk about what on earth that means. So, just in quick summary, when we're talking about interactions between molecules, we can often have ionic interactions, and I'll illustrate this in a moment. Um, and then we can have intermolecular forces, or van der Waals forces, and that can include London dispersion forces, those, those uh, changes in the electron density allowing for uh, minute dipole type interactions. We can have true dipole interactions, that's where you've got those partial charges on atoms within the molecule allowing for charge type interactions. And we can have hydrogen bonding. That's specific to hydrogen. So why do I care? Well, let's, let's walk through some examples. This is a really basic food system, salt water. So we've got a sodium chloride crystal. So sodium is the yellow and chloride is the green. And when it goes into a water-based solution, it's going to dissociate. So the sodium and chloride is going to break apart into individual atoms, actually individual ions. And the sodium is going to interact with the water. And note, we've got the negatively charged portion of the molecule pointing in. <laughs> I know that sounds really not terribly scientific, but let's let's stick with plain language here. It's it it's turning inwards with that negative charge partial charge pointing in towards the sodium, which has a net positive charge as an ion. And what's interesting is because of this arrangement, you start to have water of solvation and it forms these shells because that, that organization, going back, back to my previous slide here, that organization relates back out to the rest of the water molecules in the system. And so adding sodium chloride disrupts the structure of the liquid water. Now, we don't see a change in the water, but at a molecular level, that structure is disrupted. And uh, in, a, in a different slideshow, we're going to talk about latent heat and changes of state in water, which is uh, a really an important part of understanding the function of water and foods. Note, 
check this out, we've got the chloride. And again, chloride's got a net negative charge in its ionic form. And as such, the water turns with the positive part of the dipole moment interacting with the chloride ion. And again, that having a, an ionic solution is going to disrupt at the molecular level the structure of the water. And this becomes important when we talk about colligative properties. Colligative properties is how having a solution interrupts the ability of water to perform its functions the way that we normally think it does. And as such, it changes things like boiling point and freezing point and osmotic characteristics. And that, my friends who are food science people, is a really important thing to think about because we're starting to change freezing point or boiling point. We can start to really do some really interesting things about uh, water activity modification, which increases the shelf life of food products. And that, in many cases, is the entire goal of food science, to be able to preserve food in a safe and healthy and interesting way. So what else can water do? Well, now we've got a glucose molecule and in this case, we are seeing that hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen is interacting with the water and creating those intermolecular forces, causing that solvation of the sugar within the water. So a glucose is a sugar, and we will have later in the semester some um, slide presentations on sugars and carbohydrates specifically. But in the case of sugar, we've got solvation occurring by hydrogen bonding. Now, do we see lemon dispersion forces happening with water? Absolutely. It's just not as common to see that same level of interaction. But honestly, there are interests in lemon dispersion forces. Why? Because um, the cannabis sector in, in Canada, it, cannabis is legal across a wide variety of different products. And in many cases, the beverage industry is really curious to find out how to emulsify or incorporate really small uh, milligram quantities of highly nonpolar molecules into water-based solutions. And London dispersion forces, or those those uh, minuscule dis uh, minuscule dipole moments that are formed as the atoms. Um, the electron shell around the atom swirls around. That allows for really tiny amounts of molecules. Now this diagram is showing hexane. Hexane is a very non-polar molecule. And that just means that it doesn't have a lot of partial charges on it. And as such, it doesn't interact with water. So think about this. Hexane and water don't mix. Do we have other food systems that represent this? Well, absolutely. Let's talk about like we've got some salad dressing here, and we can think about the different types of um, intermolecular forces that are occurring in this salad dressing. Well, we've got a true solution. We've got salt. We've got perhaps not sugar, but we've got organic acids that are dissolved down here, either through ionic interactions or through um, dipole and hydrogen bonding interactions. And in the case of the oil, it's not miscible. Miscible meaning that it doesn't uh, it doesn't mix interchangeably. Do we have liquids that are miscible? In the case of food systems, the foods that we eat properly, absolutely, we do have solvents that have differing miscibilities. And um, one of our favorite solvents that have high miscibility would be alcoholic beverages. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm just going to cough again. I keep joking that we're friends at this point, and so I'm not editing out the minor hiccups just for the sake of throughput on my videos. I've got to make so many at any given time. Alcohol, in the case of the alcohol that we are drinking as a fun and interesting beverage, is ethyl alcohol, or ethanol, as, as it's often called, and it is a solution. Those of you who've been hanging out in COVID have likely been using ethanol solution as a means of hand sanitizer. <coughs> Pardon me. And it is possible to get pure 100% alcohol. It, it's expensive. It's, it's, it's out there from a reagent perspective for analytical chemists, 
but it is, it, is, it is a solvent, just like water. And as you can guess, it is completely miscible with water. If you were to mix the two together, they mix seamlessly and you do not see a difference. But if you were to mix something like hexane and water, you see that layering, just like with oil in a salad dressing. You can see that um, lack of miscibility between those solvents. In the case of uh, fat, I mentioned this before, many molecules are polar and have, for example, a lot of oxygen or hydrogen, which have those partial charges. In this case, we've got a lot of carbon that does not have that partial charge, and as such, it is a nonpolar molecule. This just happens to be a triglyceride or a fat molecule that I'm representing here. And as such, because the bulk of that molecule has very, very, very little partial charge, this molecule has a net nonpolar nonpolar density to it. So we will talk about hydrophilic, lipophilic balance when we talk about dispersions, but think about those words, hydrophilic loves water, hydrophilic or hydrophobic hates water or afraid of water. Those uh, molecules don't want to interact because again, the bulkiness of this molecule is in hydrophobic nonpolar entities, these fatty acids down on the, on the glycerol backbone. This is a miscibility table, and it's commonly used by analytical chemists who are trying to look for um, the capability of dissolving things in different solvents or mixing different solvents for uh, analysis, such as HPLC. Water is often called the universal solvent because you'll note just how many things can mix with it. And because it has the capability of participating in Quite literally all of the different types of molecular uh, interactions, it has really remarkable um, solubility characteristics. Now, something else that we do think about when we're thinking about water in foods is the fact that a lot of that water is bound up in cellular structures. Fruits and vegetables, meats, and so on, the water is all within cells. And we're, for the for the most part, we are eating biological biological products, <laughs> and as such, those cell walls and cell membranes have a really important role to play in terms of texture. Again, uh, we we had that chart earlier in this presentation where we we saw how most foods are made up of somewhere in the range of sixty to ninety percent water but we have solid structured foods. Why? Because the cell walls and cell membranes hold their shape depending on the, um, the humidity and the moisture um, within the environment, as well as the colligative properties. So for example, if you're mixing salts or sugars into mixtures, you could be drawing the water out of those cells and then shrinking away from the cell wall. And I'm sure you've all seen this in your fridge at some point in time. You've got uh, products just naturally dehydrating that shouldn't be dehydrating. This is an image of uh, limp and sad looking celery. Why? Because through evaporative losses, it has lost water and we've lost what's known as that turgor pressure. The cell water holds out the cell wall and allows for crispness and crunchiness within that celery. So turgor pressure has been lost in this celery. That said, in some cases, dehydration is a fantastic thing. And oftentimes we are dehydrating fruits and vegetables, such as these uh, lovely looking dehydrated fruits. And we're doing it intentionally because again, water is likely the most important macromolecule in food systems, but the participation of water in um, chemical reactions, as well as its important role in microbial systems, means that we need to be extremely intentional about how we're manipulating that water as we formulate our food products. All right, so I've done part one. There will be a whole bunch more videos talking about function of water, so watch out for them. I always like hearing your comments. Take care, we'll talk to you soon.